So I am Oluwetoyin Tela, aka Ancient Substance. I am originally from Nigeria, um, Yoruba father and Jamaican mom. Um, we migrated to New York, Long Island, in the heart of the golden age of hip hop. And I attended Howard University for electrical engineering uh, for my bachelor's and then received my MFA from Howard University in, uh, in 2010. So my artistic practice um, and my career thus far in the arts has evolved, but it's that definitely a linear, curvy, linear um, road. I started, I always did portraits and my main focus has been um, the black African aesthetic. That's always been something that I definitely paid attention to and wanted to elevate and make it contemporary for myself and my own visual um, aesthetic, right? And so developing this aesthetic over time, um, it was in grad school that I started to explore the indigo and the different blues. And then when I tapped into that, I was able to um, really broaden my thematic subject, right? So yes, the black aesthetic. Then I went into well, firstly, I wanted to explore enslavement era. Then we get into this thing where, you know, black history doesn't start with slavery. And it was a bit depressing, actually, just this, the horrid images that came up. So I wanted to go towards a more, um, what I call ancient future. So this imagination of African futurism. I'm staying away from Afrofuturism because I feel that kind of goes into the whole cyborg tech thing. And I don't go into the tech, it's more the spiritual space that I feel Africans at home and abroad in the diaspora uh, must hold, the space they must hold to create this future that's optimistic, that's eco-friendly, that's environmentally sound um, and spiritually progressive. So, <clears throat> One of my other approaches after um, my MFA was exploring hip hop. So when I got into Red Dirt Studio, which is in Mount Rainier, Maryland, I really had this space to just be outside of the home. My first studio space outside of, um, well, outside of finishing my work at Howard. So when I got there, I really wanted to hone in on this African um, praise in early hip hop. I guess that's the best way to put it. This RBG, this, um, you know, the African Ankh and medallion that was worn. Again, I went to New York uh, when I was nine years old in the heart of the golden era of hip hop. So it played a huge role in my outlook, right? And I already had the establishment of growing up in a village in Nigeria, um, being immersed in Yoruba uh, culture and practice. I didn't speak English. I understood English, but I didn't speak English until I came to America. So it's my second language. So coming into America, coming into um, you know, I want to say black American culture, but everyone knows New York is not, New York is more African diasporic culture. It's not just African American. You have Caribbean Americans there, you have continental Africans there. So it's this like melting pot of, of the black, global black experience. So I'm in that in this hip hop era and in an era of hip hop that was extremely positive. Either it was positive or it was fun. So, um, anyway, I harken back to that time and started creating work using the titles of these 
amazing um, pieces of literature, pretty much, right? Auditory literature, I guess. <laughs> and use them as titles. So we have um, from Dig Over Planets, one of, one of the major lyrics that I enjoyed was, um, where I'm from, nappy head is life. Like, and the more I listen to the, these, you know, diggable planets, of course, the Fugees, you have the Jungle Brothers, Brand New Being, all these people, the more I listen to it, the more I'm like, wow, it's just so timeless, right? I wonder if the music now, like, if it's going to be as timeless, you know. Um, <laughs> I'm laughing because I, I want to say this, you know, I don't know how, how much the booty hole stuff from Sexy Red is going to be timeless in 20 years, right? So I feel like I'm a visual magician, an a archivist, visual archivist, and I definitely look up to um, Jacob Lawrence, um, always seen his work at Howard, all these great um, African, African-American artists and seeing his work and seeing how he captured the great migration and visually. And if he didn't do that, like how would we, like when I think of the great migration of African-Americans to the North, I think Jacob Lawrence. And so for me, I was like, okay, what can I do for my era? What can I do that's important? You know, people my age who grew up in, the, in that golden era of hip hop, especially in New York, we always say, oh, this ain't hip hop. We have this thing, oh, this ain't hip hop. But what do we have to explain to the next generation, the ones after them? Like, what is it? We don't want to lose things like um, other generations with jazz, where rock and roll is co-opted, jazz is co-opted, all these elements, that all these, all these genres and subgenres are constantly co-opted, and then we lose the history. And what I, what I started seeing was that a lot of, there was a lot of erasure in hip hop. Um, and so anyway, this particular instance, I wanted to capture it and capture it in the um, most honorable way, which was the lyrics. And that's used in, that was used in my title. So I had an exhibition of a body of work, um, So Black I'm Bright. That was from Most Deaf. Um, I shone brighter than the darkest night. Like it's just, just that honoring of self that we had as, or we have as a collective group. It's always this thing that um, black people can't unite. And I think that's a fallacy um, because we have this collective consciousness that we all tap into. I think we just don't recognize it enough to say yes, we are all on the same page with this thing. The Alabama brawl is one example of this collective consciousness. We all felt it, like everything, that's why I hit so hard, everything that was said, we all felt it at the same time. So um, moving on from So Black's uh, I'm Bright, um, I was like, okay, yes. Same conversation I had with myself as far as this, the slavery work and then now hip hop work, I was like, I'm Yoruba, nonetheless, I'm Jamaican, I'm Yoruba, you know, I have this root in West Africa. How can I bridge all these different elements? Because I see myself uniquely where I have a Caribbean experience, a continental African, African American, and I'm in the middle of this triangle where I understand all aspects, pros and cons of all sides. So. How can I bring all that together and honor it, elevate it, and bring it to a space that um, is thoughtful, right? It's cerebral, it's visual, it's all these things. How can I do that? And what materials can I use with that? So then um, more recently, I started to go back to my, my ceramic practice, my, um, my love for photography and video, that I started in, um, in high school in, on Long Island. Um, and of course, the visual painting, oil painting. So that's basically my artistic practice, as well as my, um, my other practice of, of henna and, and dealing with these um, motifs, which, which has played, I think, an equal role in my work now. Um, 
using these abstract forms that Africans use, uh, whether it's North Africa, East, West, South, Central, um, these symbols that are used, I started incorporating that in my work. So all these different things that I do, um, I'm using it to broaden and archive the conversation of just the African experience thus far and how we can use it to project the future that we want for ourselves, our children, generate seven generations to come. So this um, exhibition, uh, bringing in all the different aspects of myself, which is really um, aspects of the African diaspora and how I translate it to art. Um, this exhibition, Expansion of Oyo, is gonna be not just here at the Hilly of this exhibit, but it's like my next um, iteration, the next iteration of, of my practice, of my work. But um, just a quick background, Oyo is an empire in West Africa, spanning Benin, current day Benin, Togo, is spread all over West Africa. So you have Ghana, Mali, Sangai, and then you have Oyo Empire. These were actually empires. And I am from Oyo State in Nigeria. Oyo State um, is where my father's from, my grandmother, this is where I was born. Um, grandmother, her people, everybody, like this is the root. We're from Ilora in Oyo. And one day it was in like a math class and one of my teachers in that particular class, he was, he's from Nigeria. And we were just talking about something. This was about, this was a while ago. And I was just like, oh, so it's an expansion of all y'all. It was, it, the phrase just came and I kept that in my mind. Like, I'm gonna use that for, for something. And so it's been there sitting on ice and after going through the stages of just the evolution of my work uh, so far, I wanted to bring in this global African experience that's me. And so I said, all right, time to go back culturally and retrieve, right? And so with this body of work, um, I'm looking at how There's this global African thread amongst black folks. And one of, you know, the Igbo have um, definitely contributed. Benin or Dahomey contributed. Um, Ghana, of course. There's all these people have contributed. But one dominating force with spirituality um, then and now with um, maintenance of culture, even language in America are the Yoruba. And I'm not just saying that because I'm Yoruba, I'm saying it because it's fact. So if you look at Brazil, and Brazil is, is the largest population of Africans outside of Africa. Their dominating influence is the Yoruba spirituality. You see it in their cuisine. You see it in, in, in again, spirituality and in, um, in just their ways. In Haiti, in New York, in D.C., in um, Cuba. So, you know, as the overarching global domination of the British kind of sort of continuation of this Roman Empire-esque thing was happening, there was an undercurrent, a natural expansion of Oyo, and that's what this work is about. This natural expansion of, um, and, and continuity of African presence, African excellence, and the African master class. So we didn't, <laughs> what's his name, I forget. We don't die, we multiply. <laughs> These are the things that go on in my head, but we don't die, we multiply. So we definitely don't, right? So this, this natural 
at a expansion and a natural um, flow and continuity of culture that Africans carried um, even through all this tribulation that's happened on both sides of the ocean, including South and Central America. You go to Jamaica, you have, you know, um, the Dibia, which is just Igbo, the Obia, Dibia, same thing. That's a medicine man. Um, and of course, you know, there's unfortunately due to brainwashing and colonial things, we've, in spite of suppressing um, our African selves, uh, the African spirit is still is expanding. You still see it. You still are it whether you like it or not, if that's what you identify as, right? Um, so that's what this body of work is, bringing all this together for me and to be able to articulate it um, without words, <laughs> except for by titles, but being able to articulate it. So with this body of work, some of the pieces, I have a piece called Omwa Ba, and it's the child of a king, right? Um, I have one, Iya Lora. So there's this saying where I'm from, Ilora in Oyo. Iya Lora, Lora and Lera, it's basically a tongue twister. And it's an homage to this thing, this tongue, like Peter took the pepper, whatever that one is, similar to that, we have it too. So it's, it's an homage to that, the mother of this space. Um, so yeah, expansion of a yo, this, the video installation I have, um, I did in 2016 when this, it, it's with my stuff, it brews. So I take, I don't forget inspiration. I just put it in my pocket and keep it and let it, or put it in the ground and let it grow and take root and take its time. But I definitely acknowledge those inspirations wherever they may be from. Um, and so with the video, it's called Rise of the Ancients. Again, remember I said my work, I don't necessarily call it Afrofuturism in that sense, but ancient futurism. So how can we take what we know um, that we've done or even we may not even be aware of and bring it to a future that is serving us in a positive way? Well, when patrons come, collectors, art lovers, everyone comes, um, old and young to this exhibition, I want them to just be in the space and take in, especially the, um, the, the abstract forms, the white on white, like really just sit with it and get what you must from it. Like I can say what I want people to get from it, which is a sense of relief that not all is lost. Um, that's, that's the major thing for me. But what else personally um, you get, whatever else you can get personally is definitely up to you. I've, I've looked at paintings myself from different artists and I get so much from it and it's just like, oh my God, and I ask somebody else, they're getting something totally different or they might not have anything, get anything at all. But it's gonna be something personal that's gonna reflect back. And white space is just a great way to clear your mind um, and be present. Be present and, and let it just pop out to you, I would say, including that sense of relief that not all is lost, you know, it's not all bad. Um, just like the expansion of a yo was happening through hundreds of years of all this stuff, all this suppression. Um, it was still expanding, it's still alive. African culture is not dead. Native American people are not dead. Like we're not extinct, we're not gone. Um, our languages are still alive. You know, similar to that, like this, now, this narrative that again, Africans can't unite, we can't do this. It's all a narrative. What can you do? What's your role in it? Regardless of whether you're African or not. 
So my plans moving forward, um, definitely being in the moment and enjoying, you know, having this exhibition. I'm really happy to be here at the Hillier. Um, my goal is to go bigger. Um, again, do more ceramics, do more video installations, um, and process this, travel, um, definitely get into um, Veve, Haitian Veve, the more of the geometric forms that are used throughout West Africa. And of course, um, I was saying Haiti because they definitely carried that on um, from Benin and the Congo. That was their influence with that. And just being in the presence of people who continue to expand regardless of global situations, who held on and practice culture, regardless of what it was um, considered, the suppression, or the oppression, all these things, people who do the work. And who's doing it now? Because this is not the end. Like, so I want to connect with those people and continue to grow as an artist and go bigger and go home. <laughs>